Good afternoon, students. It is so good to have you in General Chemistry 1 this afternoon. I am so excited. I am so thrilled. I am so honored and I am so privileged to have you as my students this semester. As we will begin, I want to remind everyone that you are not alone. This is an academic community. Remember to get help when needed. Reach out to university services if needed. Never give up. Keep trying. We are here to help you be ethical, honest, intelligent, and successful scientists. However, at the end of the day, you must be responsible, ethical, and hardworking. As we begin, I always like to reflect on the work of Werner Heisenberg. You know, he was, during his postdoctoral assistantship with Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr um, Heisenberg formulated his famous uncertainty principle. At the age of 25, he became the chair in theoretical physics at the University of Leipzig. At 32, he was one of the youngest scientists to receive the Nobel Prize. He did from 1901 to 1976. So this will encourage and inspire you, hopefully, that it's possible, no matter how young you are. So, um, let's proceed. We're going to go straight to, um, I, I'd like to begin the lecture um, discussing the significance of DNA. So, I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, talk about it. So for DNA, we know um, that in this class, I tend to ask you um, what functional groups you see, which atoms do you see, and why is DNA important? So I'm going to give you some time and I'll give you the opportunity to go through um, the structure and just think about those answers. Which atoms do you see? Um, what functional groups do you see? And why is this molecule, this polymer, why is it important? Okay, so let's begin. So right now we see that we have nitrogen. We see that we have nitrogen. We have nitrogen, let me see, there we go, we have nitrogen, nitrogen, we have, we also have, give me a second, having a few technical difficulties, so let me see if I can adjust something quickly before. I continue with the lecture for today. And just something quickly, something quickly. Okay, let's proceed. So we have nitrogen. We have phosphorus. Nitrogen, we have Phosphorus. We also have um, hydrogen. We also have carbon. And we also have oxygen. Um, yeah, so that covers most, that covers basically all that we have here nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and carbon. Um, so those are the arms that we see. The functional groups that we see we have the amine. Is the amine there? Is the amine there? Right there. There we go. We have the amine there. See? There we go. And then we also have the phosphate there and then we have other functional groups so I'm not going into all that we have hydroxyls there um and that's as far as I want to go with you today um so why is DNA important DNA is important several for several reasons one 
plays a role in the replication of cells. It plays a role in maintenance and integrity of cellular function. Um, DNA is important because mutations in DNA can cause um, diseases, can lead to downstream effects such as diseases. DNA is very, very important. It's like the information, the set of instructions, the blueprint for a specific cell. Not every gene is expressed in every cell. And we, that's a discussion for a different day. But so gene, gene expression is very dependent, heavily dependent on the genes, and genes are made up of DNA. So um, very important biopolymer. So let me erase. Let me erase, and we'll proceed forward. Let's see. So yeah, DNA is very important. It has contributed to a lot of discovery. You could go into all of the discussions as to whether it's as to it being semi-conservative in terms of replication, all those things. But that's not for this class today. So. Let's talk about the goals and objectives of this class. I'd like to remind everyone of this because it's important for us to keep focus. The goal of the class is to teach the chemistry content in a way that is relevant to the Bahamian student and digestible for their understanding. The sequence is as follows. Understand the fundamental concept A. Practice problems relevant to, the, to understanding concept A. Learn more nuanced details about each concept and practice more complex problems and integrate the details and the fundamental understanding. So today, we're actually going to go straight into our discussion for um, this lecture. This is previous ideas that we discussed earlier. There we go. So let's. I've already gone through the discussion in which we drew rest and structures, drew different Lewis dot structures. One of the things I want to do today is I want to, um, I want to emphasize some key ideas associated with resonance and resonance structures. So the resonance hybrid is a is one of the best qualitative descriptors of the molecule and it gives us an idea it points to the fact that elections are not in one position all the time it gives us a bet that it's a better description a better treatment um of a better quant it it's co leans closer and closer to a quantum mechanical treatment of uh molecular structure it gives us an idea it points to the fact that elections are delocalized it's a good structure um not perfect but it's a good description um, and one of the things I want to emphasize in this lecture today is um, I want us to look at the resonance structures of nitrate. And so look at the resonance structures of nitrate. So let me, right here, nitrate. So I want us to look at the resonance structures of, yeah, that'll be all we focus on today in terms of resonance structures, and then we'll proceed forward into molecular geometry, and we'll continue to discuss some more ideas in terms of molecular orbital theory and valence bond theory. So let me erase, and now let's proceed. There we go. So let's talk about nitrate. So nitrate, NO3 minus. So we know if we, when we look at nitrate, nitrate, nitrogen is in group five, that's five valence electrons, oxygen is in group six, so that's six valence electrons. So when we add those up, 18, 18 plus five is 23, and then we consider the one that comes from the minus charge, so plus one, and that gives us 24. That's that. So let's just um so we have that in mind. So we're twenty we're counting for twenty-four electrons. So let's come on this side right there. 
and let's draw what we think the structure would look like. So we consider all of our electrons, we take our atom, we place it there, place it there, put single bonds between each atom. So N, O, N, O, mm. let me see, let me just draw this a little bit better. Actually, I can do a little bit better than that. So let me erase, let's erase that. There we go. And let's erase that. And let's do this. And like this, there we go. Okay, so that's that. We draw single bond. So 24 minus 2, 4, 6. 24 minus 6 is 18. So we put uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. And then, okay. So six dots around these things, and that accounts for all of the things. However, accounts for all of the electrons. However, the issue that we have here is that this has a minus charge, rest formal charge of minus one. This has a formal charge of minus one. This has a formal charge of minus one. And this has a formal charge of plus two. Though this is a resonance structure, it's not the best resonance structure we can draw. Because one of the aims for re drawing resonance structures is you want to make sure you follow the octet rule. That's a big chief, chief idea. And you also want to make sure that you minimize charge, minimize formal charge. So that's one, but let's look at another one. So that's one we can draw, but let's look at another one. So let's look at another one. Okay, so this is a better one right here. See right here. This is a good one right here. It has an overall charge of minus one, and we've minimized formal charge as best as possible. Everything obeys the octet rule. So we've ticked all of the boxes. Um, so this is a good structure right here. You notice that we were able to draw two structures. You can draw different structures in which you have. So say for example, just keep that structure in your mind. We can draw a structure where we have um the double bond here. To that and, and then we have a single bond here and we have the same nitrogen cells the same form of charge over the double bond has changed position. So as you can see that's resonance structure, that's resonance structure, this is resonance structure. Um, there are several you can draw. However, um, the best structure is one that minimizes formal charge and I'll base the octet rule. And you want to make sure you, you hit all of those criteria when you're drawing resonance structures. Now we can draw another one, which we have the double bond on the other oxygen. So there, that, that, that. Uh, yeah. Actually, let me let me not rush this. Let me take my time and draw this clearly. So there we have. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. That, that, there we go. So that's another resonance structure. So we just drew four structures for the same molecule, for the same polyatomic ion. We drew same, we draw, we drew four different Lewis dot structures. Um, different in the sense that the positions of the electrons are 
the position of the electrons between each atom, it's a slightly different configuration or slightly different arrangement. That's a better word to use. Um, however, a slightly different position. That's a better word to use. Um, but yeah, so we just drew several structures for nitrate. It's famous for its resonance. And let me just note something. When we're drawing different resonance structures, um, so say we have, say we have resonance structure A, resonance structure B, resonance structure C, There we go. So that's how you know that, that you are drawing resonance structures, as opposed to so the arrows. These are the arrows resonance, and these are the arrows for equilibrium. I'm knowing this because it's important to know the difference. So this is resonance. These are resonance arrows. When we drawing resonance structures. These are the arrows we use when we're talking about equilibrium. So it's important to just note that difference. But um, I just want to show that to you all, but let's move on. Let's move on. Let me just erase, guys. And then we're going to proceed. Then we're going to proceed forward. Sorry about the background noise. Let me just erase. So it's important key ideas for that I want you to take away from this exercise. You can draw different restaurants, draw different new start structures for molecules that tend to have double bonds and single bonds um, in the same structure. Um, and it's important for you to know that the best structure or the best resonance structure you can draw minimizes formal charge. And it also follows the octet rule. That's a big thing. The big idea is make sure it obeys the octet rule, especially for second group elements, second period elements, excuse me. Okay, so let's talk about so this is just, I want to, another thing I want to do is I want to make sure you understand how to study this type of material. Now, some um, people, when it comes to andragogy or uh, learning when it comes to adults, some people may promote um, everyone learns differently and you must just figure it out yourself. I'm going to show you how I um, study this material, how I go through material and how I'm I able to understand it as your professor this semester. So I'm going to show you how I study this material. So we're going to discuss, say, for example, so this is going to be a very uh, engaging discussion this afternoon. Say, for example, you were given a piece of a pamphlet or you were given uh, a section of a textbook. And I told you, I need you to study this quickly, study this in about three or four days. And I want you to come back and I'm going to assess you on this. Say you had a very uh, specific reason to study. So we've established our goal, we've established our motivation. We want to understand rules for resonance forms. And that's the topic. And it has objectives, so we know what should be our um, what should we achieve? What should we aim for? What should we strive for as we are studying this material? We want to keep these things looming in our mind as to, as to, am I doing something that complements to me achieving these objectives? So the objectives are, after completing the section, you should be able to use the concept of resonance to explain structural features of molecules and ions. And then also it says you should understand the relationship between resonance and the relative stability of molecules and ions. So off the bat, the concept of resonance, resonance points to the fact that electrons are delocalized. And it points to the fact that those structures don't give us the best description, qualitative description as to the arrangement of electrons in a molecule or ion. So that's, that's kind of like an overarching, uh, a general idea or general answer to that first I objective. And then the second objective says understand the relationship between resonance and relative stability. 
So what is that saying? We understand that the localization contributes to stability. The localization of the electron cloud around the entire molecule contributes to stability or gives us an idea of stability. It points to the fact that the stabilization or stability of a molecule comes um, from several uh, things, it comes from several um, properties. But one of the things it comes from, or one of the things that contributes to stability of a molecule is the fact that you have the localization of the electron cloud. And what is that based in? It's based in Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law, in which you have a positive charge interacting, positive charge of the nucleus of the different atoms interacting with the electron cloud. And the more it interacts, the more interactions you have, the lower the potential energy, the more stable the molecule. Systems tend to lower potential energy and that contributes, or that is another way to say, is tend to more stable configurations, more stable arrangements of the electron cloud. So that's kind of like the overarching solutions, overarching answers to those objectives. But I'm going to show you how I study my material. So let's begin. So let's go through. So the method I want to introduce to you today, if I can just, there we go. The method I want to introduce today is this, question, the, this method that they call survey, question, read, review, and recite. So let's talk about it. So I do this implicitly. Um, the, material, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to survey the material, S. We're going to think of the questions in terms of the objectives that we need to achieve when we read this material. So the questions we're going to have in mind are going to be centered around or targeted at the objectives. We're going to read it again. We're going to review it. And then you're going to recite the key ideas that are associated with this piece of work. So SQR, there we go. Survey question, read, review, recite. So that's how we're going to do this. You can look up other methods if this doesn't work for you, but my goal for you is to understand this material. So let's begin. First thing we're going to do, it says recognizing, drawing, and evaluating the relative stability of resonance. In this case, this is a, a excerpt from Creative Commons material, the chemistry they protects. So recognizing, let's begin. Recognizing, drawing, and evaluating the relative stability of resonance contributors is essential to understanding organic reaction mechanisms. So that's a big idea. Um, when learning to draw and interpret resonance structures, there are a few basic guidelines to help. It says there's only one real structure for each molecule or ion. This real structure is the resonance hybrid. It takes its character from the average of all the individual resonance contributors or alternative Lewis dot structures. So when looking at resonance contributors, we are seeing the exact same molecule or ion depicted in different ways. Resonance hybrids are really a single unchanging structure. Okay. And don't confuse um, resonance structures with tautomerism. Um, anyway, um, the resonance hybrid is more stable than any individual resonance structure. So we're just surveying the material. Let's see. Um, the resonance hybrid shows the negative charge being shared equally between two oxygens. Three resonance contributors do not have to be equivalent. Also, this means the resonance hybrid would be the exact same exact mixture. This Also, this means that the resonance hybrid will not be an exact mixture of the two structures. Um, all resonance contributors must be correctly with structures. All resonance contributors must have the same molecular formula, the same number of electrons, and the same net charge. So you also have major and minor resonance contributors. So say I, so let's make this more practical. Say I am I have other things to do. Say I have other things to do. And I need to study this material within one or two hours. That's the time constraint that I'm given to go through this material. My goal is to get at least a B on this test of this material. So we're making this very practical. I want to get at least a B because I have other classes I'm studying for. One. Two, I only have about two hours tonight to study. I'm going to refresh my memory about 
uh, in like an hour or so tomorrow, within an hour or so tomorrow. And then my test is on um, the Monday. So for the subsequent days that follow, I'll review this material probably for like an hour or so, an hour or so. So this is my first introduction to this material. So I want to spend about uh, two hours. I'm going to condense it for this lecture, of course. But two hours, I would give a lot to this, my first introduction to this material, two hours. So in this two hours, the first thing I'm going to do is survey the piece of material. So I'm looking at the material. I'm looking at the main ideas. Typically, when people write paragraphs, see, you got, this goes back to English. Typically, when people write paragraphs, the main idea is the first sentence, the topic sentence. So I'm looking at that, keeping that structure in mind as I read. So the main ideas for each paragraph should be in the first sentence or last sentence. The middle paragraph, the middle portion of the paragraph will give an explanation or exposition as to what is being said for the first or last sentence. So I'm going to, and scientists are very logical in how they write. Typically, they're very logical. They want, they write it with the audience in mind. So we're surveying the material, surveying it. So we're looking at major and minor resonance contributors, rules for estimating stability of resonance, the so resonance structures in which all ions have complete valence shells is more stable. We're talking about the octet rule. That's you can annotate and put that on the side. Um, the structures with the least formal charge is most more stable. That points to the fact that uh, minimization or minimizing formal charge, having things uh, but not having structures that don't have uh, that many charges. And then three, the structures with a negative charge and a more electronegative ion will be more stable. So that, 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 that coincides with chem chemical logic. Um, the structures with a positive charge in the least electronegative atom is more stable. Very good. That's another idea. The structures with the least separation of formal charge is more stable. Separate, that least separation of formal charge is more stable. Good. And then resonance forms are equivalent. That are equivalent have no difference in stability. So we're surveying this material. So this is a little bit, this is like a little bit beyond general basic chemistry in terms of um, some of these ideas, but we're only studying that which is relevant to us for general chemistry. So we just survey the material. So let's read through it. Recognizing, drawing, and evaluating the relative stability of resonant contributors is essential to understanding organic reaction mechanisms. So as we're reading this, we're going to annotate. So let me get the highlight up. I'm going to highlight first. Um, some people are proponents of highlighting, some people are not. The reason why I'm highlighting is because when we review, we're highlighting the main ideas and we're going to annotate what, based on what we need to associate with that main idea to memorize it. So let's highlight. Okay. So before we get to that, let's make this a little bit. There's only one real structure for each molecular ion. That's something we're going to highlight. That's all right. Bam. Only one real structure. And what's that structure called? That is the resonance hybrid. So remember, our objective is to understand the concept of resonance, to explain structural features of molecules and ions. That's the first goal we need to achieve. That's the first objective we need to fulfill. So resonance hybrid. Resonance hybrid. What's that? OK. From the average of all individual resonance contributors. So it's that. Look at that. Some people are proponents of rereading. I'm a proponent of rereading. Repetition is good, in my opinion. Some people believe you should just read through material, come up with a set of questions, form a guide, guided inquiry. Um, and then practice going over those questions and over and over and over and over again and do it with space repetition and all those other good stuff. That's good if it works for you. If it doesn't, you have to come up with an alternative method to study. And this is what works for me. And I hope it contributes to your method of studying. You have to be strategic. What are you going to do to learn best? Um, 
and the material as best as possible, given your time constraints and resource constraints. So let's go through it. There is only one real structure. We have that. One real structure. The structure is the resonance hybrid. And it takes its character from all the average of from the average of all individual resonance contributors. So we have contributors to the resonance hybrid. And the resonance hybrid is the only real structure. So if I was annotating that, um, the main thing, if I was annotating that, let me see. Let's see. Text. There we go. So let's, let's annotate this. So if I was writing on this, it would be um, real structure. Let me just drag this over a bit. Real structure, resonance hybrid. That would be my first annotation I would put there. I'll put that around the side there, right there. That's like that's like the big, big, big idea. And then I would draw, I would do a next annotation right here, right here. I'm showing you how I study. Okay, so that's the first annotation. And then this hybrid is based on contributors. Those contributors and contributors, full force of the hybrid is based on contributors. Contributors are L Lewis dot structures. Actually, let's just say Lewis dot structures. Lewis dot structures. There we go. So that's that. And I'm going to take that and let's just let's just make this just a tad bit smaller. Lewis and Lewis dot structures. There we go. That's the first annotation right there. So let's keep reading. Um. So, it says the resonance hybrid is more stable than any individual resonance structures. So let's see. Resonance hybrid is more stable than any individual resonance structures. So that's the first, that's another idea. Resonance hybrid is more stable than any individual resonance structures. That's our second main idea. So what am I going to do? I'm highlighting. See, I'm engaging. I'm actively reading the material. Not just passively reading it. So let's get, let's put in, that's our first, that's our second idea. And what's that point to? The localization. So we want to put that in right there. Why is it more stable? The first thing I associate with that stability, the localization. And I'm going to, let me see if I can decrease the font size. Um, Actually, Let's just put that right here to localization. Cause that's a, that's a big idea. So when I come back to this material on the second or third or fourth day, I have a mind map. I have a way, I have a place for this material that I've associated with a framework that I already have in my mind from previous ideas, previous discussions, previous concepts, the localization and Coulomb's law. Coulomb's. And we know just to further develop that positive and negative. Lower potential. So let me see if I can decrease the size of this. Select that. And let's see if you can decrease the size of that. Let's just do that like that. Okay, so localization. Potential energy. Okay. So that's that. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, so we have our second idea. I mean, this is our first reading. First reading now, first reading. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, often resonance structures represent a movement of a charge between two or more atoms. The charge is spread out. So that points at the localization idea. 
spread out. Spread out amongst these atoms. And therefore, And amongst the atoms, and therefore, more stabilized when looking at the picture about resonance contributes res represent resonance contributors represent the negative charges as being on one oxygen or the other. See, we ex we're further explain that main idea of it being delocalized, of it being more stable than any individual resonance structure. We're further developing that main idea from the first sentence. And the rest in time with the negative charge is spread out. See, we're, we're still rehashing that same idea of the localization. So let's go to the third point. Where since contributors do not have to be equivalent. Okay, so what does that mean? What is that equivalency or what is that weighting coming from? It comes from the further ideas we'll discuss in terms of how does it really obey the octet rule? Does each atom have an octet? Does each atom have a full beta, complete valence shell? One. Two, um, are we, do we have uh, as less or least as possible, do we have um, minimal separation of charge? Have we minimized formal charge? Those types of ideas contribute to the weighting of the resonance structure or resonance contributor to the resonance hybrid. So resonance contributors do not have to be equivalent another idea so what's that pointing to it points to let me erase that it points to points to so it's pointing to the rules that we'll discuss further on so just keep that main idea in mind so you have to you have to come up with a framework. You have to come up with a structure that works for you. If you find that yeah yeah your study material is not as engaging, try to make it or try to find engaging material. There's a lot of free material out there if you have access to the internet. Okay. All resonance contributors must be correctly with structures. So we go that goes back to an idea we discussed earlier. So actually, let me see. Let me erase that. Then highlight them. All resonance contributors must be correct with structures. So that's rules for drawing those structures. And then let's go to the next idea. See, we're trying to maximize time now. Maximize our time, the thing the amount of learning that we're able to do within a specific time frame. All resonance contributors have the same molecular formula. Yeah. Same molecular formula and same number of electrons and same net charge. So it's not, I'm not dealing with isomers in this class. Not in general chemistry one. Okay, it's not. So the same molecular formula, same number of electrons. Okay. The number of electrons and same net charge. So these are what contribute to how we weight these things. It being correct with that structure, it having the same molecular formula, same number of electrons, same net charge. This, this is the guide, the guidance that we use when we're determining whether this is even a proper contributor, whether it's even a contributor to the rest of the hybrid. So let's let me see. Let me see, let me see like that. There we go. The highlighter. And this. That idea and then that idea. It's that. So that's kind of how I would approach this first page. I hope you see the trend here. We highlight our main ideas, we annotate based on the framework that we have in mind, the previous concepts that we've already gone through, how we can map this on to achieve objectives one and achieve objective two. Hopefully you see what I'm saying. Hopefully you understand. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, however, that's what I want you to understand. 
and we're going to move forward with the lecture today. Okay, there we go. Let's move forward. Um, least formal charge, we do the same thing again, just use the associative framework that we have in our mind based off the facts and ideas we've already discussed. So these are more rules for determining resonance. Just keep this in your mind. Okay, so let's get to the topic for today, <laughs> the discussion for today. Okay. Lecture attendance is mandatory, folks. Class assignments are placed on the online platform. We go through this. Office hours occur via Zoom on Mondays and Fridays. Try not to fall behind to make the class for you a more enjoyable experience. Okay. You have an exam coming up on October 26th. So let's talk about Lewis structures and molecular geometry. So we are in chapter nine in chemistry essential science. Um, I want you to be able to understand and describe three dimensional shapes of molecules using the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Um, it's also called the galaxy nyam theory. Um, determine whether a molecule is polar or non-polar based on its geometry and the individual bonding arrangements. Be able to identify the hybridization state. So hybridization is just referring to mathematical mixing. Warbler, that's a, a, a short and fast way to describe it. It points to the fact that it points to an idea in the valence bond theory. Um, be able to sketch how orbitals overlap to form sigma. The sigma comes from the shape and also the fact that on the internuclear axis, sigma and pi perpendicular to the internuclear axis, perpendicular. Pi bonds, be able to explain the concept of bonding and antibonding. So bonding is going to come from the fact that when you have constructive interference um, occurring with atomic orbitals, um, that results in a bonding molecular orbital and antibonding. When you have destructive interference occurring between molecular orbitals, that results in the antibonding molecular orbital and atomic orbitals equals n molecular orbitals. Um, so the same number, it's conservation of atomic orbitals. Um, be able to draw molecular orbital energy level diagrams and place electrons into them to obtain and uh, obtain and understand electron configurations of diatomic molecules using molecular orbital theory. And as we'll discuss later on, um, S and P mixing, and um, that gives you an idea, uh, points to some stability in which the way you arrange that um, energy level diagram changes as you go from between two different atoms or two different diatomic um, molecules. We'll get into that later. Understand the relationships among bond order. So bond order, bond strength, and bond length. So let's continue. Um, what is bonding? Why is it important? What are the types? And what types of elements tend to participate in the different types of bonding? So bonding is a theoretical construct that involves the attraction of the electrons of an atom to the nucleus of another atom. It's important because it provides a foundation for chemical reactivity. Bonding occurs as a means for elements to share, attract, or distribute electrons in order to become stable. You have three types of bonding that we're going to discuss in this class. Covalent bonding, ionic bonding, dative bonding. Covalent bonding occurs when ions share electrons as a means of bonding. It occurs between non-metals and non-metals. Ionic bonding occurs between metals and non-metals. This is bonding between ions, cations, and non-ions. The bond arbor cycle gives us a, a way or a... a method or a description as to how that structure is formed, how the ionic compounds formed. We discussed that in previous lectures. Data of bonding occurs when one element donates the entire bonding pair of electrons to form a coordinate covalent compound. Typically it occurs between metals and ligands. So let's get to the material we want to discuss for today. So you have three more bonding models that we want to just I introduced in this class, you have the Lewis model that helps us understand and make educated predictions about chemical observations. You have valence bond theory. It provides a more quantum mechanical treatment of the electron, but not as delocalized along the entire molecule. And then you have ML theory, which is like the creme de la creme for this class. Um, it provides a full quantum mechanical treatment of the molecule and its electrons as a whole. Lewis model is named after Gilbert and Lewis. And you have the valence electrons represented as dots. Your electrons are forming your bonds represent sticks. 
Um, and you have chemical symbols to depict the molecules. So let's just go through this again. One thing, so note, place, subtract, and draw, minimize. So NPSEM, NPSEM, SEM. Oh, so note the total amount of valence electrons. Place single bonds between each atom. So let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. Let me make sure. N, N, P, SEM. N, P, SEM. So note, place, subtract, intro, and minimize. Note the total amount of valence electrons. P, place single bonds between each atom. S, subtract two electrons based on the number of bonds added. E, ensure each atom has an octet. Exceptions are with atoms with expanded octets occurring in the third period, and also exceptions occur with your know, incomplete octets, for example, with boron and beryllium. Um, then you minimize charges. That's These are the ways you draw really good Lewis dot structures, really good contributors to the resonance hybrid. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so bonding theories help us predict the circumstances under which bonds form and also the properties of resultant molecules. Chemical bonds form because they lower the potential energy between the charged particles that compose the atoms. Metals and non-metals result in ionic bonds. Non-metals and non-metals typically result in covalent bonds. And metals and metals typically result in metallic bonding. So we've already discussed how to do electron configurations. We've already discussed the bond arbor cycle. So let's get to what we want to discuss for today. So in terms of common polyatomic ions, I will want you to understand the really, really common ones. And I'm going to, for this class, I'm going to, I'm just going to, let me, so for example, I want you to know your perchlorate. I want you to know permanganate. There's a minus charge. Uh, I want you to know sulfite. Let me do this a little bit better. Okay. So I want you to know. Here we go. I want you to know chlorate. I want you to know perchlorate. I want you to know permanganate. I want you to know sulfite. I want you to know sulfate. I want you to know cyanide. I want you to know ammonium. I want you to know phosphate. I want you to know nitrate, hydroxide. That's the thing we talk about a good bit. Um, carbonate, bicarb. Mm, and that's as much as I want you to know. So, mere erase. Here we go. There we go. Let's keep going. Okay, let's go. We already discussed resonance. So let's talk about Vespa. So Vespa. Vespa, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Big ideas. You minimize repulsions between electron groups and you maximize distances and you want to maximize the bonding interaction. So let's keep this let's keep those big and I big ideas in mind. Minimize repulsions between electron groups, maximize bonding interactions, maximize distance between those things. And you want to keep those things in mind. So linear, beryllium chloride. So say, for example, we have this. This is a classic example of a linear molecule. I'm using a model kit. If you don't or if you can't afford a modeling kit, you can use gumdrops. You can use styrofoam. You can use anything that or it's gumdrops and toothpicks. You can do a lot of things with gumdrops and toothpicks. Um, and you can use toothpicks to, as the bonds and gumdrops as the different atoms. But I'm using a modeling kit for this video, this lecture video to the, this afternoon. So this is beryllium chloride. This is a linear molecule. We can also use this um, a shape to describe carbon dioxide. However, in carbon dioxide, you have double bonds. Okay, so trigonal planar. Beryllium, I mean boron, trifluoride, trigonal planar. Trigonal, 
It's in one plane, one plane, trigonal, planar. Or a better way to draw that, because that's not a better way to do that, trigonal planar. There we go. Trigonal planar. Trigonal, one plane, trigonal planar. Okay, so let's talk about methane. Methane, tetrahedral. 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 See? Tetrahedral. There are four faces. Tetrahedral. 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 Okay. PCL5, trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal. Trigonal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal. You have your trigonal face right there, and it's bipyramidal. Bipyramidal. Okay? Then you have your octahedral. Octahedral shape. There you go. So, octahedral. Let me... Let me, yes, yeah, this is going to work. There we go. Octahedral. It's octahedral. Octahedral. I just want you to see the shape of them. Octahedral. See, we have six electron groups. One, two, three, four, five, six. Someone pointed out in class that the vertices. So a, a way, an analogous way to think about this, the vertices and the shape in some way do correspond to the electron groups. So if you keep in mind that if I'm talking about electron groups, and also one thing to always specify when you're talking about molecular shape, do you want the molecular geometry or do you want the electron geometry? Because they can be different at times because I can have uh, three electron groups, but one of those groups can be a lone pair. And if that's a lone pair, it may not be. So I may have three electron groups. If one's a lone pair, instead of it being linear, it will be bent. And we'll get to that later on. Um, so... Octahedral, for example, sulfur hexafluoride. So all molecules have a particular shape. The shapes are determined by looking at the arrangement of electron bonding and non-bonding pairs. Correct Lewis dot structures provide the ability to predict common molecular shapes. We are able to determine molecular shape by looking at the angles and distances between the nuclei and the electrons. Remember, single bonds are sigma bonds, double bonds are sigma and pi, triple bonds and sigma R sigma and 2 pi. So that's kind of pointing to ammo theory uh, concepts, ammo theory ideas, but I just want to expose you to it now. So this is a link you can use to look at simulations from Oxford University. So questions to consider when assigning molecular shape. Let's just go through these questions. So for, the, for those who do inquiry as they read, do we have the correct Lewis dot structure? How many bonds do we have? What type of bonds are they? And remember, Single bond, double bond, triple bond, lone pair, all of those fall under the umbrella. They fall under the umbrella of an electron group. Single bond, double bond, triple bond, lone pair, or non-bonding pair. In this context, there, those terms can be interchangeable. Non-bonding pair, lone pair, fall under the umbrella of electron group. So how many electron or pairs or non-bonding pairs? Where are the non-bonding pairs? Let me show you. We keep on talking about these non-bonding pairs. Let me show you. So say, for example, we had some molecule. Say we had water. This is, this is one that has two lone pairs. Okay, one has two lone pairs. So say I said, um, I want the molecular geometry of water. Let me go. Let me show you a classic example of this. So I said I want the um I want the molecular geometry of water. So look right there. Let me let me narrow this into you. So this is an example of me building it. It's going to be V-shaped or bent. However, so this is this is the molecular geometry, the geometric shape. However, the number of uh, electron groups that we have is four. 
You have four electron groups in this thing. So it's important for you to specify, do you want the electron geometry? Do you want the molecular geometry? Typically, people want the molecular geometry. They want the molecular shape. So this is what we're referring to here. It's, it's bent. But it has four electron groups. So just keep that in mind. Let that question loom in your mind. So more questions to consider. Where are the non-bonding pairs? Because if they're, not, if they're not on the central atom or the atom that really determines the shape of the molecule, um, it's not going to be heavily considered, um, at least for the particular question you're looking at. Um, are there deviations from this ideal description? So valential electron pair repulsion theory allows us to understand molecular geometry. In VESPA, that's a, that's a short way to say it, via CPR, we arrange electron pairs to minimize electron pair repulsion and maximize distance and bonding interactions. So this is what I'm showing you here. So say we have four electron groups, but two are lone pairs, two are atoms, three, two are single bonds, excuse me, two are lone pairs, two are single bonds. This is an example of water or um, sulfur dichloride. Okay, so, that, so let's look at another one. Another one, say for example, we had, um, so this is an example of an octahedral one in which we have uh, six electron groups and six are single bonds. However, say we had two of those electron groups as lone pairs. One, two. So we have something that's square planar. So let me just show you. So the power of being able to build it yourself. You know, learn by doing. This is for those who are proponents of that. Learn by doing. So see? Square planar. Square planar. It's in one plane. See? It's in one plane. One plane. Square planar. Square planar. However, it has six electron groups. The power of building it yourself. When you build it yourself, it makes a little bit more sense. You're able to flesh out the concepts more. So that's what we're pointing to in this lecture today. Um, so we can have six electron groups and it can be T-shaped. So, so that means you have three lone pairs. Three non-bonding pairs. I'm going to use the same color for these so that we know what we're referring to in this. So you can have different colors for your lone pairs. Not in actuality, but I'm talking about for the modeling kit. So say we have three, three non-bonding pairs, and it's T-shaped, but we have six electron groups. So another way for us to phrase this, find the number of electrons the central atom, the central atom normally has in its valence shell. Add one electron for every atom that the central atom is bonding to. This is just one way to go through it, or you can... Um, remember, the main idea I want you to take away from this is arrange electron pairs in the correct shape. Okay, so in terms of repulsions, lone pair, lone pair, repulsion for this discussion is greater than bonded pair to lone pair, which is greater than bonded pair to bonded pair. The main idea I want you to take away from this discussion is use the proper rules, use the correct rules to draw your Lewis dot structures. And when you do that properly, when you write good Lewis dot structures, it can help you make or write and understand good resonance contributors. And from those good resonance contributors, you can determine the resonance hybrid. That's one thing you can do with a good, Lewis, a good set of Lewis dot structures. Two, when you draw the correct Lewis dot structures, you can apply that Lewis dot structure, use that Lewis dot structure to understand the molecular shape or predict to a certain extent the molecular shape. It may not correspond exactly with what we see, and that's the reason why we have to use valence bond theory. For example, with hydrogen sulfide, you have deviations from it. Instead of it being a completely linear, you have deviations. So hydrogen sulfide, or instead of it being tetrahedral, whatever the case may be, you have deviations. Um, whatever geometry you're referring to in this case, molecular shape or electron geometry or molecular geometry, you have deviations. But when you draw correct Lewis dot structures, you are able to understand molecular shape. You are able to um, determine good resonance contributors and look to see 
or approximate to what the rest of the type would be. It's very a very useful tool. And also in organic chemistry, we know that when we draw good Lewis dot structures, we can kind of kind of give a description as to what's occurring, the mechanism as to how the reaction is occurring. So Lewis dot structures are very useful. Okay. So VESPA is based on the simple idea that electron groups, which we define as lone pairs, single bonds, multiple bonds, and even single electrons, repel one another through columbic forces. So you want to make sure you're looking at the central atom. So valence bond theory. So this is so, say for example, remember we talked about this conceptual baton passing in which we had, um, uh, we had Max Planck passing it on to Albert Einstein. Actually, excuse me. We had um, Niels Bohr. We had Max Planck passing it on to Albert Einstein. And then you had Einstein passing it on to Niels Bohr. And then we had Niels Bohr passing it on to Werner Heisenberg. So what I'm saying is typically a way, a way for you to process the concepts. So same way we did that, for this thing, we could go from Lewis dot GN Lewis Lewis dot structure, say if Lewis dot structure was the concept, the main idea, the person with the baton, passing it on to valence bond theory, and then valence bond theory passing it on to molecular orbital theory. This is a way to process the concepts so that you can build on it if this works for you. Okay, valence bond theory is a more advanced theory, uh, which is an application of a general quantum mechanical approximation method called perturbation theory. We're not going deep into that. It's not quantum mechanical class. Just want to expose you to it. So in many cases, these orbitals are just SPD and F. In other situations, the orbitals are hybridized. VBT, valence bond theory, we calculate the effect of these interactions on the energies in the atomic orbitals. So when we apply valence bond theory to a number of atoms and their corresponding molecules, we arrive at the following general observation. The interaction energy is usually stabilizing or negative when the interacting atomic orbitals contain a total of two electrons that can spin pair with opposing spins. So a chemical bond is a result of the overlap. of two half-filled orbitals with spin pairing of the two valence electrons. And then also the geometry of the overlapping orbitals determine the shape of the molecule. So VESPA predicts that dihydrogen sulfide, this is what I was pointing to earlier, has a bond angle of 109.5, but VBT excuse that it should be 92 degrees, not 92 degrees Celsius. Predictions coincide better with experimental results of a bond angle of 92. Okay, so that, that comes from the fact that Vespa gives an idea, VBT gives us a better gives us a better idea, a further a more complete explanation. That's the better way to put it. So VBT accounts for the bonding in methane and other polyatomic molecules by incorporating an additional concept called orbital hybridization. So hybridization, the maximal mixing of atomic orbitals to form hybrid orbitals. This is where you get these ideas of SPDF or SP2, SP, SP3D, SP3D2. Um, it's referring to the mixing. So it's a mathematical procedure in which standard atomic orbitals are combined to form new hybrid orbitals that correspond more closely to the actual distribution of electrons in the chemically bonded atoms. A chemical bond is the overlap of two orbitals that contain two electrons. The greater the overlap, the stronger the bond and the lower the energy. In hybrid orbitals, the electron probability density is more concentrated in a single directional lobe, allowing greater overlap with orbitals of other atoms. So we're gonna just keep on going. Hybrid orbitals minimize the energy of the molecule by maximizing the overlap in a bond. So this is, this is like hinting to or based in the Col Coulomb's law ideas from Fulham's law. So let's talk about MO theory. So this is just an overview. This is just introduction. So this lecture is like the introduction to these ideas and you have to go and do your readings, go and practice the homework. So there's, that you play a part, I play a part in this learning process. I help to facilitate you. I help to facilitate, we break up the ground, we help with conceptual ide ideas forming, helping you see where you can put in your associative framework for learning and pedagogical ideas, I mean, andragogical ideas. And then 
you are able to apply the concepts. You are able to associate it with something you know, and you're able to learn it and flesh this out and make this more real to you. Develop your scientific intuition, all those things. Um, use these as ideas you can apply in your classroom, apply in other research settings, all of that. So ML theory, this is just an orbital diagram. We have a sigma, sigma star, sigma referring to a bonding orbital, um, sigma referring to a bonding orbital, sigma star referring to antibonding, sigma, and you have a pi, pi star, sigma, star. In MOT, we do not actually solve Schrodinger's equation or molecule directly. Instead, we use a trial function, an educated guess. The trial function we use in this case would be LCAOs, uh, linear combination of atomic orbitals. However, no matter how good our guess, um, nature is the best at minimizing the energy of the orbital. The simplest trial function that we are going to use in this class is LCAOs, linear combinations of atomic orbitals, which is basically a weighted linear sum of the valence atomic orbitals of the atoms and the molecules. So this big idea that I pointed to earlier, n atomic orbitals equals n molecular orbitals. Sigma orbital, the name is derived from the shape and position on the internuclear, internuclear axis, and pi orbitals, the shape and position um, shape is name is derived from the shape and the position perpendicular to the internuclear axis. So antibonding orbital, you have destructive interference results in MO higher than the energy um, for the atomic orbital. This MO is an antibonding orbital. Bonding orbitals are derived from the constructive interference that occurs with, um, that results in a MO lower in energy than the atomic orbital. This is your bonding. And then the bonding MO. So bond order is 0 0.5 in brackets. You look at the electrons in your bonding molecular orbitals minus the electrons in antibonding molecular orbitals, and you multiply that whole difference by 0 0.5. So this is what I was pointing to earlier. I want you to take note of this. Take note of this. You see, as you go from di um, nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen to diatomic oxygen, you have a switching. You have a switching of the order. So you go from pi to p, to sigma 2p, and then for oxygen, diatomic oxygen, you go from sigma 2p to pi 2p. So where does that come from? We're not going into a deep quantum mechanical explanation for that. This is a general chemistry class. What we're going to do is get the main idea, get the short the short summary condensed um, answer for that um, question. Why does the oil change? The bottom line is that SMP mixing is significant in diatomic boron, carbon, nitrogen, but not in diatomic oxygen, fluorine, and neon. That's the surface level. That's just what we're going to talk about for that. So MO theory, let's continue. MO theory helps us understand diamagnetism in which you have, uh, you, which you have paired electrons or paramagnetism in which you have unpaired electrons. And you can see an example of this with supercooled oxygen. Um, being held up between two magnets. So our references, those are our references, and that's where we're going to end off our discussion today. Once again, it was so good to have you in lecture today. So good to see you. So good to know that you're in my class. Excited to have you in my class. I want everyone to know that you're not alone. Keep up the work that you're doing. Keep pushing. Keep going. We're cheering you on.